Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Full Court Press MMA. I am your host, Drew Duncan. Don't forget, you can always find me on social media. That is at Drew Duncan 83. And additionally, you can find the Full Court Press MMA on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube for all Full Court Press MMA full videos. Guys, I made promises that we're going to have a huge lineup of interviews coming in. We've already had fight promoter Time Doon Keen on the program, and I am more than excited to introduce our next guest. He goes by Smash. He is 13 and 5, and he is currently Jamrock FC champion at weight 155, fighting out of Mississippi, currently training in his warm surroundings down in Florida. His name is Martin Brown, and he's right here with us on the Full Court Press MMA. Martin, first of all, I want to tell you it is a huge honor to have you on the program, and thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to speak with us. Uh, No problem at all, my man. Martin, first of all, one of the things that I kind of want to get into is you as a fighter. You you see guys all the time that um, are kind of wild. They're kind of brash. It's not necessarily you. You remind me more of a low-key type of guy. But obviously, the situation with McGregor and Habib has uh, come to a head, so to speak. What do you, When you look at that situation, what do you see? I see business. I see promotion, you know, um, as long as it don't get out of hand. But, I mean, these days, I don't think it matter if it get out of hand, depending on how much money you bring in. <laughs> and if you're an amateur fighter and somebody get hurt, you know, you're going to get scrapped. But, you know, when you're talking about somebody who brings promotions, millions of dollars, I mean, I don't think they care about, uh, you know, one little small incident as long as more people talking about it. You know I mean? You can be... I've seen many fighters that are good but can't sell tickets, so the promoters don't look to bring them on the show. It's still a business. I mean, I think a lot of guys got to understand that when they're coming up in the sport. You know, that's one of the things that Time, the fight promoter that I just made mention of that we had on the program, spoke about yesterday. She made mention of, look, I need somebody that knows how to promote themselves. You can be professional and show up and make weight and have the heart of a fighter. But if you can't sell tickets in your own hometown, you don't really belong in this business. And that's why she said that promoters now have to go so mainstream because they need that huge audience. Would you agree with her statement, Martin? I mean, I, you have, it's one of those things, you know, it, it sucks because, I mean, there's certain demographics that don't really sell like that. You know, um, and for instance, from a cultural standpoint, you know, uh, amongst black people, in my opinion, it's, it's not that big as boxing is so like um a lot of times you'll be talking to a promoter and they're like you know as opposed to like hispanic people man they don't man they're gonna follow their their team or their guy even if he is literally like oh and five you know what i'm saying but i mean because i mean it's a culture that's like big on fighting you know whether it be boxing whether it be mixed martial arts you know so I mean, when you got guys who can't sell tickets, man, promoters not gonna gonna be looking forward to putting them on. You know, I used to be a champion in Mississippi for a promotion called Psych Out, and I was literally working in a. I had a profession where I had access to just about the whole city. I was a barber, and I never forget this. After winning the belt, I couldn't sell one ticket. So here's the interesting part. So one day, I ended up having this fight with this guy, and um, I just, I mean, I was hyped. Um, I didn't even want to shake his hand. The whole crowd booed me, and it's like, I hate that guy. He's so arrogant. And, man, the ticket sales went up because they wanted to see me get beat up. But I walk, I never forget, you know, walking to the promoter and being like, man, I'm really sorry. You know, I wasn't trying. I was just hyped for the fight, you know. Um, and he's like, no, no, I don't care. Just, you know, I'm glad. He said, listen, if they, I know you can't sell tickets, and I was thinking about not putting you on another car, but, I mean, they're either going to pay to see you win or they're going to pay to see you lose. And I'm fine with them paying to see you lose. I was like, oh, oh, I, I guess that's how it, works, how it goes, huh? All right, I can take it. So now I'm the villain and happy to be the villain. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, I think when you understand how that how that works, you know, if you can't sell t- tickets to your own demographic, then you're going to have to make, the other demo, the opposing demographic hates you. 
at least in my opinion, you know, just just make sure that some way, shape, form, or fashion, you're a tabletop discussion, you know. And we see that in all sports, right? Tom Brady, to so many people, is a villain. But yet the Super Bowls that he are or that he's playing in, every single one of them continues to gain ground in the ratings. So whether you want to watch him win or watch him lose, does it really even matter as long as it makes dollars, it makes sense? That's it. At least to the promoters and, you know, as a participant in said sport, if you don't sell tickets, they don't I mean if if the promoter won't be um, you know, he he won't be like head over heels about putting you on whatever the show is or paying you. You don't sell tickets. If I don't see a way to make money in a capitalist society, then, I mean, I'm not going to pay you either. So, I mean, I, as soon as people understand how that works, you know, I think it'll end all the confusion or accept how that works. You got guys, I mean, I I was one of those people when I started. I hated comedy, <laughs> to be honest. But it was it was kind of jealousy, you know. I'm like, man, I'm out here grinding, and this dude just walked on the scene and and instant millionaire, you know. And man, I could barely get two grand for a fight at that time, you know. But I mean, I hooked up with Jahai Wingfield, and you know, he used to always tell me, you know, it's all about like, what do you bring to the sport? You don't bring nothing to the table, man. Why would I, why am I gonna put you on? So just un- once you understand how that works, you know. And you, it's it's easier to understand what needs to be done. I mean, CM Punk, CM Punk killed it, you know. Uh, and he doesn't really do MMA, you know. I mean, he's been training, but it was obvious there's the mixed martial artists and there's CM Punk. But and everybody was mad about it. But I wasn't. I'm like, man, how many tickets did he sell? How many people went to go see him fight? The same thing when Kimbo was fighting. I mean, Kimbo had an audience. As long as there's an audience, I mean, people are going to be willing to pay you. We're talking to Martin Brown right here on the Full Court Press MMA. I am your host, Drew Duncan. He's currently in training right now, and he's the title holder at 155. He's originally from Mississippi, training down in Florida currently. One of the things that you made mention of, Martin, that I kind of wanted to get into was, look, the MMA and WWE crossover, we're starting to see it happen more and more often. Yet when I interviewed guys like Hoist Gracie, Big John McCarthy, they all said, look, this isn't WWE. This is MMA. This is for real. It's not scripted. And yet we see the crossover. Jack Swagger, a lot of people felt like was spoon fed an opponent. JW Kaiser, very good friend of mine, actually happens to be from Leavenworth, Kansas. How did you see all that? Was Jack Swagger spoon-fed somebody, or did they kind of go after the right guy? Look, here's the guy who's one and one. He claims he's got all these other fights under his belt. How do you see those situations? You know, I, I actually heard about it. I didn't even see the fight. But in the end of the day, um, if I, I mean, here's the part that nobody's going to want to hear, and I'm just going to cut it to you straight, man. If a promoter knows, this guy's a ticket seller, and they know that they can keep making money off of him. Like, you can't make any Now that CM Punk got beat up, nobody want to see him fight anymore. I mean, that's about all the money you're going to make. They know that there's a clear distinction between him and a mixed martial artist. And to be completely honest, you know, I mean, nobody, I mean, people are upset about that. And then the guy that they put in front of him, um, I mean, he he wasn't any good either, you know. So it made it look like, man, why why did you waste my money? It's not even a show. And then right behind it, you got real mixed martial artists, and and, and people can see the difference. But I mean, if the guy's winning, you can create a soap opera off of it. Like I'm always gonna be on the edge of my seat, wondering, like, all right, he did beat this bum, but. I still want to see him in there with somebody who can fight. And he beats somebody a little bit better. They can continue making money off him. Like, well, I want to see if he, well, let's put him against somebody like this. Let's put him against somebody like that. Like, as a more you can keep putting him in there with somebody and keep us on the edge wondering, like, when, you know, um, I want to see him with this style. We know what's going to happen if he fights somebody who can fight. 
You know, we know what's going to happen if he, he just started mixed martial arts and he fights somebody who's been training in this for years. You know, we all know what's going to happen. I mean, honestly, I think people need to sit back and enjoy the show. You know, I mean, I knew Conor McGregor wasn't going to be Floyd Mayweather. I I just wanted to see the fight. I wanted to be entertained. You know what I mean? I, it, did you, you have to ask yourself this. Were, when you spend your money, were you entertained? Did you get what you paid for? And that's, I mean, as long as you get those kind of things, man, like, like you're paying for a show. You know, if you get that, then, I mean, you should be happy with it. You know, I, I, I don't want to see, uh, a, a wrestler in there with a, with a well-trained mixed martial artist with a deep record, you know. I mean, I mean, a pro wrestler, I mean. I don't want to see him in there with, a guy who was going to smash him. I want to see him in there with somebody his level. I want it to look competitive. So, you know, they can continue to stay up there. Because you go in there. Well, you, I don't know what weight class that guy is fighting in. But you go and you put him in there with any of the guys in that weight class on the pay-per-view show, man, he's going to smash. I mean, he's going to get smashed. Everybody knows. So there's no need of getting him smashed. And then... You know what I'm saying? They're ruining the promotion's chance of making, you know, making any more, any more money off of that guy. I mean, honestly, let me ask you something. If, if you knew Andre 3000 was going to fight Drake, you know neither one of them are mixed martial artists, but you're going to watch it. I'm gonna watch it. I'm gonna watch it. I'm gonna watch it. I want to talk about. I want to talk about Drake getting beat up. You know. I might. I might pay good money to see Stephen A. Smith fight David Carr. That felt like a real possibility for a while. You know what? You know, I pay for that too. I I pay. You know, we talking about Stephen A. You know, I pay for anybody to beat up Stephen A. Though. Full disclaimer, Martin said it, not me. <laughs> I'm just playing Stephen A in case you ever hear that. <laughs> Everybody, we're talking to Martin Brown, a.k.a. Smash. Uh, Martin, there, there's been a lot of things going on in the, in the MMA community, most of which now is turning into the weight-cutting issues that we're starting to see. You, in a previous interview yourself, said, look, Part of the reason why I don't take a lot of fights is because I refuse to try and cut weight. I take better care of my body, as I'm paraphrasing, as you can see. Um, is there some more responsibility on the fighters and coaches? I mean, who does it really fall on when it boils down to it? Because obviously, you're very smart about taking care of your body. Why aren't other guys taking those same precautions? I think it's, it's just the tutelage, to be completely honest. I was. Back in the day, I you you know yeah I'm from Mississippi. You know we were one of the last states to get an athletic commission. So you know none of us really knew about mixed martial arts. We was watching, and I I learned that an arm bar was you grab his arm and pull it between your legs. <laughs> you know so so we didn't know much about cutting weight or anything like that. So and then it's it's so diverse. And where do these guys come from? You got. Some guys who come from wrestling and they cut they weigh in that morning, whereas uh, boxers weigh in. I mean, boxing and the pros they weigh in the day before boxing. The amateurs weigh in that morning. So um, everybody had their own mixed opinions and views on on how you get that done. But when it comes to cutting weight, I think that doesn't really fall on the on the fighter um, unless the fighter sees him. I think a lot of that has to do with your tutelage, your coach. You know, before I met the coach I have now, I used to cut 20 pounds in a, in like a couple of days and be dying right before I step on the scale. And, um, you know, after I just, after I met a boxing coach, I started doing gradual cuts. Now I do come in the ring a lot smaller where I don't feel too bad, you know, going up, I mean, leading up to the weigh-ins, and I definitely don't feel bad going in the fight. Um, so, like, I I feel like gradual cuts are fine, and I actually don't cut any more than, like, seven, eight pounds. Um, other times, before I wake up, and I only have to cut, like, a pound or two. 
I feel great, don't feel fine. I mean, I mean, you'll see me weigh in eating a hamburger right before I step on the scale. You know, mm. so, but I, whereas I used to come back and I used to cut weight and make 155, come back in like 183 pounds. And now I can only make it up to like 71, 72, sometimes 68. Uh, but I feel faster. I feel like I can fight forever, whereas I used to gas no matter what kind of shape I was in. I used to gas in the third round. Um, not only that, the other thing I've been paying attention to from a lot of the older boxing coaches, they say that um, they say that when you cut a lot of weight, I mean you can't take you can't take big punches. You know, um, a lot of I mean, it, especially in reference to T.J. Dillashaw, you know, when Cejudo cracked him, they was like punch really wasn't that big, and even though he wasn't graceful, he should have been able to eat that punch. I mean, but then you have like a lot of veteran coaches like, man, he cut way too much weight. You know, it's like your brain's still a muscle, it's dehydrated, it's gonna, you're gonna go right out. You know, when you cut a lot of weight. So, um, and as far as personally, I feel like that's that's true, you know, I mean, I feel like I'm able to take a little bit more of, I don't really get hit that much anyway, but I feel like I'm able to endure a little bit more. And I've cut a lot of weight, uh, a lot of weight, short notice, and sometimes stuff break on me. Like I broke my hand in a fight one time, uh, cutting too much weight. Because you cut calcium as well. So <clears throat> I do gradual cuts. I feel like the gradual cut is the best way to go. And I also feel like Along the way, you know, listen to your body. So listen to your body like, oh, man, this, this don't feel right. Um, and uh, train, I mean, how you train, too, is a factor. You know, I know people that are like three days out from the fight and they still train at full speed. You know, thing, all of that stuff, in my opinion, uh, takes its toll on how you perform that night. You know, you should be recovering and healing from all of the injuries you had during the camp that week. So, um, I don't know. I mean, that's my opinion. Martin, you're in training right now. Why don't you tell everybody uh, how they can find your next fight, where it'll be available at, when, where, who, all that. I mean, right now I'm still signed with Titan FC. You can find it on the UFC Fight Pass. So, I mean, where am I training at? You know, Gracie, Brandon at the moment, but I'm all over the place, mm. to be completely honest. I get it. I've been getting it in at uh, Fusion XL with Julian Williams, Mike Perry, Jocka Ray Souls, you know, all the who's who. So, um, and then, I mean, there's nothing for you to find me in anybody's gym, you know, just looking for different looks along the way. So the day of the fight, you know, you don't get in and be surprised because you hadn't seen a look like that. You know, so, like, nothing really surprised me at this point. So, I mean, hey, uh, yeah, find me a tight. The next fight should be on uh, for Titan FC. So, basically, hit Lex up. Tell him you want to see me get back in there. I'm back. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Uh, Martin, this is the part of the program where I give my guests an opportunity to say whatever it is that's on their mind. There's no right or wrong answer here. The floor is 100% yours. Nah, I don't have anything to say, man. You know what I'm saying? Just keep <laughs> looking out for me. You know, this whole champ thing is new to me. <laughs> I've had a belt before, but I haven't. I've never had a reach like this. Man. So at this point, man, I'm gonna. You know, I'm a, I, I want to try to stay humble at least, even though there's no such thing as a humble champion. You know, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to. I'm, I, I don't know, man. I'm, I'm soaking it all in. I'm still learning how to do this. I'm still picking other people's brains. Like, yo, how do you guys make money outside of the sport? You know, you know, what are you guys doing financially? You know, what are you guys doing to stay relevant? How are you guys building a brand? You know, I'm still learning. It, so, you know, I mean. I don't have anything to say. Just hope you guys stay tuned, man. You got hope you guys One. keep me relevant. Uh, hey, we're going to do what we can. I know this much. Whatever happens, I think you're going to make a hell of a fight promoter one day, Mark. And that is coming from the heart, sir. No, thank you, sir. You're very welcome. All right, everybody. I am Drew Duncan, host of the Full Court Press MMA. His name is Martin Brown. Martin, thank you once again for joining the program. 
We've got plenty more to get to. We've got Stephen Wynn coming up on the program, and Austin Ford will be joining us as well. Don't you dare touch that dial.